Welcome to the GovComs podcast, bringing you the latest insights and innovations from experts and thought leaders around the globe in government communication. Now, here is your host, David Pembroke. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to GovComs, the podcast that examines the practice of content communication in government and the public sector. My name's David Pembroke. Today, we reach back into the archive for a very special interview with a very talented communicator, Trish Johnson, who was then the Assistant Secretary of Communications at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in Canberra, Australia. Trish has a wealth of experience, and she's worked across a number of super complex policy issues, including domestic violence, cybersecurity, Indigenous affairs, climate change, resources and energy, and preventative health. And her experience scans the those large-scale government advertising campaigns, strategic communications, PR, media issues, management, and digital strategy. Today, Trish is the Assistant Secretary at the Communications Advice Branch at the Australian Government's Department of Finance, where she heads up all of government's campaign. So it's a very, very big job. And interestingly, I had lunch with her last Friday at a, uh, a local pub here in Canberra, and it was very, very enjoyable. Um, she's lost none of her edge, but I really enjoyed this conversation back in 2016 as we explored the great opportunities for government to do more with content. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. My conversation with Trish Johnson. Trish, as the sort of boss of communications there at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, give me a sense of what's a, a typical day look like for you? Well, a typical day at PM&C is pretty hectic, as you can imagine. I can um, imagine. Not, not only do we, um, you know, need to respond to the Prime Minister's office, we've got a couple of portfolio ministers as well, and Minister... Cash is the Minister for Women and um, Nigel Scullion's the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. We've got a few Assistant Minister's offices that we need to look after as well. And of course, there's all the internal departmental communications. So, you know, we're, we're going in all directions all the time, ranging from web, web work, strategy development, media inquiries, speech writing. So we do all the speech writing for all the offices as well. So it's a busy branch. And how do you work out what's the priority? in terms of what it is that you and your team have to have to do? Well, I guess our number one stakeholder is the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. So okay. anything Fair that enough. comes from his office is the number one priority. <laughs> uh, and then similarly from the other offices. So the, responding to the offices is a key part of our role. Then I think I look at the work in terms of where can communications expertise add the most value. So um, I think you've talked on other of your podcasts about the shift from strategic to tactical in communications over the last several years. I try to focus our efforts at the strategic end where I think um, we can really enhance the way that a policy or program is going to be received in the community because of some good communications advice rather than at the tactical end where perhaps we can buy that, um, that skill from outside of government like graphic design, for example. Yeah. But how then do you, how do you stay strategic in an environment that does move, that does change, that can be so volatile, depending on the issue of the day? I think it, it is a struggle. And I think um, what we're learning to do is just pause, even if it's, even if it's only for a brief minute in a very busy day and where something has to be delivered, we're pausing to go, what's the strategic purpose of this and where can we really add value? Even if that process is very short, we're trying to uh, train ourselves to right. do that first, not just to respond and go, here's the tactics we can do for you, but take the step back, think about, you know, why are we doing this? What are we hoping to achieve? What are the best channels? And can we measure what we're going to do? Now, in terms of trying to turn that fire hose off, how do you manage up into those political offices? But also, most importantly, I think, and increasingly important, importantly, how do you manage across into the policy areas so as that you're really managing it as efficiently and effectively as you possibly can? 
Look, it is difficult. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's it's not an easy thing to do. And I guess what we've been trying to do, what I've been trying to do is really build capability within the branch so that all of our interactions within with officers and with line areas is sort of at that high level strategic um, interface and then trying to get into the policy conversations with the ministerial officers, with the policy area as early as possible so that we're sort of embedding communications in the policy outcome as opposed to coming to us at the end and saying, can you make this brochure look pretty, please? Yeah, it's that notion of transitioning comms into that strategic function as opposed to being an order taker. Yeah. What's some of your advice to people to get into those conversations? Because I know this notion of how do we get a seat at the table because traditionally comms hasn't been particularly well regarded in in government and public sector organisations. So what advice do you have to people in terms of how do you actually get that seat at the table? Well, I think... um you really need to have some support for the, from the top and that, that's sort of been a very critical uh, element of my ability to get a seat at the table. So our former secretary, Michael Thorley, thought that it was very important that communications was embedded in all of the conversations at the strategic level. So I have access to meetings that perhaps other of my peers uh, don't which is very helpful just to have visibility of what's happening across the organisation and to kind of preempt issues. Um, I think there's a lot of relationship building that you have to do. It's really just sort of, um, you know, walking the boards for want of a better um, yeah. description and letting people know what you can do. It's delivering. So actually delivering what you say you're going to deliver because I think delivering is actually where people start to go, Right, okay, these, these people are more than what I thought they were. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes uh, in comms we can be a bit precious. So there are times when we just have to deliver what the client wants, whether we think it's a good idea or not, and sometimes we just need to do that. And we need to know when are the times to do that and when are the times to pause and say, actually, we need a little bit of a minute here to think about this and to give you our very best advice on this. Okay. Um, so I think... You know, all parties have to to do a little bit of work. So let's get, let's pull apart pull that apart because there's a, there's a quite a few really interesting things in there. Um, getting that support of the leadership was that in the leader, or was it because you were able to get to him and to explain to him here's where we can add value, and therefore he could see that okay that that's useful, that's going to be relevant. So yes, you can come into the conversations. Look, I think it was a little bit of both, but primarily it was in the leader. So he had come from contexts where he'd seen how important it was to have your communications right and yeah. to have those people closer to decision making. So I think it was in the first instance Michael and then, you know, we then needed to deliver. So I think in being able to deliver a few key um, pieces for him um, or for the department really, yeah. not for him specifically, um, our value grew and he could see that we could um, – well, we should be embedded in some of those conversations. Now, in terms of delivering those outcomes, are they the result of good strategic planning where you were able to get in early, understand the issues and come up with a plan or were they because you were good at executing on the run um, against some sort of emerging and quick, quick developing problems? Uh, look, I wouldn't say we got in at the beginning – I think most of the opportunities have come when a problem has occurred and there's been the question asked that said, why weren't comms involved from this, in this from the beginning? And then um, we've been given the opportunity to do the strategic work. So it's kind of learning from failure, really, okay. and then being able to deliver fairly quickly. I think, I think the days where you've got long time to plan and ponder are probably gone, but I I do think there are some instances where we can ask for a little bit more time and get it if we can prove why we need it. Do you build planning schedules into your, say, your year-long work where you're looking at a, a schedule of programs or a, a body of work that needs to be delivered? Do you ever get the opportunity to be thoughtful and really stop and think, okay, we're going to crack this problem and then we're going to you know, be able to deliver the solution? Look, there are a couple of projects where we do get to do that long-term planning, constitutional recognition sort of being one of them. We've yep. been 
involved in that from the beginning and there is a lot of long-term planning involved in that. But most of our work is much more short-term than that. Having said that, we are in the process of trying to get that long-term view, particularly for content planning for our social media channels. Yes. Um, so that, that requires quite a um, coordination exercise, really. Yeah. Uh, so that we can get a, an organisation-wide view of, of what's coming up and try and develop a bit of a forward plan in a more strategic way. But it's you know, it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, we'll, obviously we'll, we'll get to that discussion about content and, and content marketing and how you're embedding that into your processes to deliver those outcomes. But just before we do that, I'm really interested also in how do communications people build credibility with policy areas? So we, I, I get the, the boss, hopefully they know and understand and they can see the values, but how, how do you get the policy people to understand that there's a real value in what the communications team can can offer in terms of the explanation of the particular piece of policy that's been developed? Look, one of my previous secretaries, I think, summed it up most nicely when he said, uh, it doesn't matter how elegant your policy is, if nobody understands understands it or knows what they need to do about it, well, then it's a policy failure. Yeah. So I think I think the uh, opening is to explain to policy people that you're not trying to take over their policy, change their policy, you're really trying to help them achieve their objectives. And if, if it involves citizens of Australia, <laughs> well, then they need to be communicated with. Um, it, and I think the other thing is that we actually need to demonstrate um, – our own analysis. So why have we come up with these particular um, approaches? Yep. What, why are these the best communication approaches that we should use? Because I think what's happened, and it's because of uh, speed and responsiveness, you know, there's a set of pretty standard comms responses that people feel that they see over and over again. So it doesn't feel strategic. It feels very tactical. Yeah. So what I'm trying to encourage my team to do is First, go to evidence. Is there any research available in the public domain that addresses the issue that we're trying to deal with and that we can bring to bear so that we can bring another insight? You know, when a policy person comes and says, mine's the most important topic in the world and everybody needs, the whole of Australia needs to know about this. Well, you know, there's some really good you know, regular polls out there that tell us what people in Australia really are worried about and where their issue sits in that list. So that's helpful to bring to the table. I think um, it also com communications theory is sometimes useful to bring to the table as well. Say what we know about communications and how it works, you know, the rule of seven. People have got to see it many times in many different ways it, to, to actually start to get a message, you know. So bringing some uh, evidence and theory to the discussion I think helps raise our credibility. Yeah, and have you, have you cracked that? Uh, do you have a really... Uh, like a standardised approach as to how you will engage with policy areas to step your team through, here's our approach? Yeah, look, we're, we're on the beginning of that journey. So okay. we have developed a, a sort of um, here's how to ask the right questions when you go to the policy meeting, um, you know, try to avoid giving off-the-cuff advice, say I'm going to come back to you in one day, two days, however many days you think it's going to take you, but quite quickly and then go away and do your evidence. And then we've kind of moved from writing those long communication strategies that, you know, we spend hours on and then summarily get put on a shelf and never implemented <laughs> yeah. to actually treating it like a pitch. So we're, a, you know, we're a, consult, we're a communications consultant. We come and pitch to the line area what we think is the best idea. Yeah, right. And we've done that a couple of times. Okay. So we are at the beginning of the journey mm -hmm. and it's going well. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, quite an agile method of being able to get in, get the information, come back, put it together and come back very quickly, turn around and say, okay, based on what we know, based on what you've told us, this is what we think is going to work. Yeah. Actually, and and what the other thing we're doing, which is a little bit different, is trying to involve other people in the branch in the strategic thinking part. So now, who whilst, are they? Well, uh, our other strategic thinkers, right? So instead of, you know, normally one person gets a project and they work on it, oh, they squirrel okay. away in the right. corner on their sure. own and yeah, right. they don't talk to anyone about, you know, <laughs> we, we have sessions where we get 
all yep. the all the EL one say or anyone who's interested in a particular topic in a room, okay. give a bit of context, and we say what are what are some wild ideas here, and we just throw them around and. What I've noticed, again, we've done that, you know, half a dozen times now and you just get a much broader range of options to think about because yeah. there is so much cre- creativity amongst communication people. So why waste it by just giving one person a task? And it's not, it, you know, it's not too onerous. It doesn't take too much time. Yep. Um, and it keeps people stimulated because I think people who are really interested in the strategic part of communications like the thinking part, like the nutting through a problem, yep. you know, how will we solve this? And uh, so I think everyone feels a bit more engaged when we do that. So the, the creative pieces, and that's always good fun, you know, come in and all care, no responsibility. Here's a whole heap of ideas and that's that, that it, it's very engaging. And I think it's one of the great things about working in government and the public sector is that what you're thinking about are really interesting problems yeah. and important problems yeah, as they, they relate to, to the Australian people, which is why most of the people who listen to this podcast are engaged in it because they're not thinking about how to sell more laundry, de- uh, laundry detergent. No. They're thinking about how to, you know, get more people to accept or or to take up a, you know, particular program of some That's sort. That's right. But I'm interested also then in terms of the, the science side of your approach. How... How well developed are you in that area of being able to understand the creative piece, but then also to to measure and evaluate some of these programs that you're putting in place? Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't say we've cracked that nut. <laughs> I mean, I think evaluating is hard. Um, obviously, we're looking at ways online to use, you know, the different tools you can buy in the market to measure our online um, reach and impact. But I think, I mean, I think there are a couple of different qualitative measures that you can use, you know, how successfully was the implementation of program X or Y, how well informed do the um, program participants feel, were there a lot of media issues, you know, were um, service providers, did they feel well supported? I mean, you can do that sort of in an informal way. Yep. Um, But I think it is hard because it's also not just communications, right? It's policy design, it's stakeholder engagement. So all of those things come together um, in an evaluation of how effective, you know, a program or policy is. And I think we're just one part of that. So I think the real question is how do we get policy and program people to embed communications evaluation in their evaluations, you know, to see communications as an integral part of program delivery? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because... Again, you can't take responsibility for a program failure or um, success yeah. because, again, as you say, it could be the design of the program that That's right. may, in fact, have impacted the, the result. Yeah. Now, just on, on indulgence here, I, I have a theory that I often discuss with my guests around the increasing importance of communication given the changes in technology that we've seen and how we're now, you know, the ubiquitous nature of technology, the distribution of mobile devices, the fact that everybody who we need to connect with in order to achieve our objectives are on the grid. Mm -hmm. And really the challenge is to activate that connection. And generally we'll get to the discussion about content in a minute, which is, you know, that atomic particle really that does open up that connection. But are you seeing that reflected in terms of how communications is seen, that there is people within your organisation understanding that big contextual shift that is taking place outside that, you know, everyone is now there, everyone's, we can get to people and therefore communications has never been more important for us because that ability to be able to link and engage and connect with people is in fact better than it's ever been in the past and therefore much more important for us than it's ever been in the past. Mm. I think it's patchy, I'd have to say, in our organisation. There are obviously parts of our organisation like uh, the open data policy people and the cyber security people who have big online constituencies and they know the value of, of communicating online and they're in, a, in effect they're sort of dragging us forward because okay. you know That's good. they're they're um, they're already doing it so the rest of the department needs to catch up um, and I'd say in other parts of the department it's completely not on their radar so it is it is a struggle. Um, I think where we win the conversation is in cost effectiveness. You know, if we do if we do online communications really cleverly, it's cost effective. You know, it can really be 
effective in reaching your target audiences if you've done the work to establish those online networks. Um, and it can be um, quick, you know, it can be done quickly, yeah. much more quickly than sort of traditional means of communicating. So we've got, I think we're at the very beginning of a journey. Okay. We're, just, we're just moving the department to, you know, we launched our digital first <laughs> approach last year and mm -hmm. we're kind of dragging people along with us. Is there a resistance to it, a reluctance to it, or are people just so busy doing what they're doing that they really haven't had time to sort of stick their head up and think, oh, how has the world changed in the last little while? I think it's a bit of both. I think that um, people are very busy and, you know, it's they don't see it as part of their role to think about how to reach their, their yeah. um, program recipients, which I find kind of funny, but um, they don't. Um, so I think it's partly that. And I think there's a sort of a mismatch between you know, the direction possibly that departments might want to go and then either what people have done in the past or what ministers' offices might want. For example, you know, we're, we're very um, rapidly trying to move away from developing glossy bro brochures for the announcement of each new policy. Now, some areas really get that. You know, the Closing the Gap report this year was, uh, was an online report, interactive report, which was really well received across all of the stakeholders and, and government stakeholders as well. Um, so that was an example of where we'd like to go. And then in other areas of the department, because we've always produced a glossy, they want a glossy. And yeah. it's sort of like, wow, that's so 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> Although printed material does have its place. It does. You know, at, at the right time, depending on what the audience needs. But yeah. I don't think it's a default order, order yeah. if you know what I mean. That's well, right. you know, this is how we've always done it and this, that's what we'd like this time around. Yeah. So listen, tell me about your journey into content <laughs> and how your taking on that challenge, that ability to be able to go direct, the ability to be able to get so much more out of the events that you create and out of the, you know, excellent, smart people who you've got working for you and turning that into really useful, relevant, valuable and consistent content that enables you to build those audiences with, um, with the citizens of Australia. Look, you know, as I said, we're fairly early in our journey. So we, we got a Twitter account in August. <laughs> you know, so, um, and look out. Look out. We're, we're out there. Um, and look, I guess it's, it's an interesting and a long journey. In, in some parts of the department, we're a bit further along. We, we already had um, Indigenous.gov, which is an um, engagement channel with Indigenous communities that already had Facebook and um, yep. Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and everything attached to it. So that was kind of quietly happening under the radar. Um, and it is it's very effective with Indigenous communities. Um, we wanted to uh, obviously expand the department's presence to a, a whole of community sort of presence. So we're working on a couple of things. We're working on um, upgrading our website to make it more um, user-focused rather than the website sort of reflected the structure of the department, yep. not the way that um, users might engage or the users we want to come yes. as opposed to the users that were coming. Um, now how's, to, how's that going? Well, <laughs> it's still being developed. The ideas <laughs> no, or has it started? No, or? the website itself is still being developed. That's not a process that's ageing you prematurely? Is it, is, it? <laughs> it is a little, but I'm very optimistic. <laughs> that will be, um, you know... Nothing could age you more than an intranet, I think, but, you know, people out there will know what I'm talking about. Um, so that process is in train and that's quite exciting because that is quite a content-rich oh, yeah. design that we've come up with now. Oh, right. Um, so we do need a lot more content. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, we're, we're babies at Twitter and we've, we're progressing, you know, cautiously. Yep. But the next move is to... Because we have such a diverse uh, policy scope in PM&C, having a central departmental uh, channel on Twitter is probably not the way to go. We need no. to break it down into Completely our agree. Completely constituent. Agree. Yep. So we're, we're just starting that process, Yep. Um, which I think will be exciting because I think that we'll be able to, with some really effective outreach to get people following us um, and retweeting us and all those things, um, 
I think we'll be able to establish really good stakeholder channels. No question. Um, no question. Which are and, much and I, more effective than the ones we're using at the moment, which are email lists. You know. Yeah, <laughs> although, you know, again, they have their the, – the email lists obviously have their role as well. But I think it also goes to this point of the actual content in government and the public sector is so rich with interest. You know, if you can tell a good story and tell a compelling story and with the graphics or the animation or the, you know, getting that emotion about what it is, how hard is that going to be for you to become great storytellers? within a very traditional policy department? Look, I don't know that we're going to ever be great storytellers, <laughs> um, but at least telling some stories. And the thing is that we are very content rich. You know, there's so much great stuff in Indigenous affairs oh. that's happening. There's great stuff in Office for Women. There's but so great... many smart people working in the policy areas yeah. as well. Yeah. Unlocking all that, that to me is an absolute goldmine in the government and public sector is yep. getting people to think slightly differently about the contribution they can make. And hey, come over here. Yeah. We've got a platform for you to actually yeah. help you build policy and help you find out what stakeholders want to know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very content rich. So we're sort of starting small in a sense. And what we've done recently on the Women's Workforce Participation Agenda, we've sort of developed a, a six-month content plan where Great. we, you know, in the same way that you would in a normal, you know, a traditional communication strategy, acknowledging that third-party advocacy is always a very powerful yep. um, tool. So what we've been doing is sort of capitalising on all the events that we know the minister's going to anyway. So there's a whole social media strategy that includes infographics and things every time she's out speaking. And then we get the key stakeholders at the event and we film them and we do interviews with them and, and we create content nice. for later. Yeah, like so we're, we're like getting it. a bit of content in the bank so yeah. that we can actually just sort of yeah. continuously drip it out over time. Good. Indigenous Affairs, as I said, is we already get some content there, but in a um, fairly uncoordinated way. So we're looking at how we can coordinate that and actually skill some of our staff that are on the ground in community to be able to take a little bit of a video for us. And, you know, I think the thing that um, we need to sort of impress upon people is it doesn't always have to be high quality. It doesn't have to be beautifully, you know, be have beautiful production values. It, it You know, an yeah. iPhone will do the job. Yes. Um, for a short yep. Twitter video or... Um, so there's a program of trying to train people. But I think the main thing is that people need to – there needs to be a bit of a shift in mindset that this is not additional to their work, this is part of their work, yeah. to tell the good news stories of the government's policies and programs. That is part of a policy or program job. Um, yeah, so you, in that case you're not just talking about the comms team. You're no. talking about – The policy teams. The policy teams. Because ultimately getting... they've got to identify the content. I, I don't know what's happening in all of the, you know, 20 offices across yeah. Australia. The people out there know what are the great stories and what are the ordinary stories. And yeah. I can do the bundling and I can do the writing and, you know, I can maybe send someone out to video. But someone has to identify them for you. And the people that are best placed to do that are the ones that are closest to the ground. Yeah, and there's no another one of my often sort of retailed theories through the podcast is exactly that, is that the future is really going to be about distributing that capability to the edges, yeah. to, to, to the places who are closest to the audience because the need for speed and that need of understanding and being able to quickly turn things around is where we're going to go yeah. and that's where we're going to have to get to and the role of the communications people is going to change in a, to become more strategic and more understanding of where the whole program is but the delivery will be very much you know, at the edges, which comes to, which takes me to the point of skills and skills development. So that alone is an interesting point. And I think that's something that people should mark down and understand is that, you know, that skills development is not just about the teams who may work for you today in stakeholder engagement and communications and advertising, marketing, whatever it is, public relations, whatever you have them categorised as. But it's 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 additionally. But how, how are your skills at, in, in that, in that centre pool of people you've got at the moment, given the fundamental changes that we're looking at, you know, given this shift to content, how well are you prepared for it at the moment? Well, I think we've got a few people that are very, um, very skilled in content planning, um, which is 
which is great. As so, in understanding the type of content for the right channel at the right time, those yeah. sort of things. Yep. yep. Good. Um, so I think we've got some skill there. I think the real trap is that I also have a lot of, you know, under 30s working for me. Mm -hmm. And I think people think because they use Twitter or Facebook or Instagram that they know how to really use it. And I think that's the trap. If we, if we believe that, we won't go and seek the expertise that we really need to seek because I think there's much more sophisticated ways of using these channels than we're currently accessing. So what I'm trying to do is bring in different voices, to different, different experts to talk to us about how to really get the most out of these channels, not just how to do a tweet. I think we can all kind of work that out. Um, but why tweet, when, how, how do you build your audiences, um, you know, when would you use Facebook versus Twitter? You know, it may seem obvious, but I think, you know, advertising in um, in social, you know, I think there's quite a bit of um, nuance and targeting and things that can happen there. So I don't think we've got those skills. So I'm trying to sort of bring us all up together. And it, obviously I'm learning too. Um, it's sort of not the stuff I studied at university <laughs> however many years ago. Um, so I think... Um, we have got we have got some in-house skill and we're developing video skill as well so we've we've actually got a role that is about producing video content and I've skilled up a few people across the branch to be able to do that but you know our our policies and programs are delivered in remote areas so really I need people in remote areas to be a little bit more skilled which yeah. is where what we are planning to do but I think we're at the beginning of a journey again sure. to repeat myself well the other thing is that, but it's but it's the begin I think we're at the beginning, all of us, all the time, you know, because things are moving, things are changing, behaviors are changing, tools are changing, technology is changing. So we really need to sort of adopt that scientific methodology of test and learn. Mm. You know, at this point in time, this is what we think is our best judgment as to the communications program we need. Yeah. But then let's press the button, see how it performs, get the learnings, adapt, change, but really get that mentality that we're going to continue to Evolve. Roll on and roll on and roll on as as, as yeah. we go through. Yeah. Are you optimistic? You sound like you're pretty. You're enjoying yourself. Like it's not too much. Like oh, where do I start? Or you know. no, I think it's amazingly yeah. opti uh, You know, an exci exciting time. Um, because I think the future of communications is not in large spend advertising campaigns anymore. And I think generally communication. Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> <laughs> That's just my personal view. <laughs> My personal view. Um, and communication budgets have shrunk yeah. across government. So I think, um, you know, online communications offers us lots of exciting opportunities that don't have to be expensive. So no. I think, I think, you know, in a, if we were talking about low-budget comms without online digital comms, then I'd be quite depressed actually, but I think it's opened up a whole new Pandora's box for us to get really creative with and prove, you know, how we can help policy areas through these, you know, new and exciting channels. Okay. Just a final question. If you had a magic wand and you could, you know, whiz it across the, the, the branch that you're in charge of, what's the, what's the one pebble in your shoe? What's the one thing that you're thinking to yourself, I wish I could crack that nut. I wish I could solve that problem. I think it really is in the digital space and my sense is at the moment that there aren't probably lots of people out there, except maybe a few big banks and things, yep. that are doing digital comms really, really well and I think there's a lot of people who know the words to use um, but I guess what I want is for us to move to the next level and not just be talking, um, you know, theoretically about how these things move. I want us to, to hit the see ground the and results. see some results yeah. and see that people are engaging with us online and be able to say to our executive, mm. see, this does work. Yeah. So I don't think we're there yet. I think we're still, it's still a bit theoretical. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, listen, thank you very much to giving, for giving up so much of your valuable time to come in and share it with the audience today. We have a global audience, so we have people listening all over the world, and I know that they would have got an enormous amount out of that. So, Trish, thank you very much. You've been listening to the GovComs podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. 